name is Mikhail. Uh, I'm here to speak cloud, serverless, uh, and some geeky stuff, performance. Uh, let's start with a simple definition. Uh, specifically, I'll be talking about something called function as a service. Service is a bit ambiguous term. That means that uh, in one slide, I can explain it this way. You as a developer, you need to come up with a piece of code. In this case, it's JavaScript, but can be a language uh, supported by the, your favorite cloud provider. You write one function, and then on top of that, you need to define some configuration about which event should trigger your function. For example, when a user hits HTTP endpoint, or a message comes to a queue, or a file is uploaded, you say, I want to run my function in this case. And then you package this, you give this to your cloud provider, and it's good, because now it's their responsibility to make sure it runs all the time. Very simple, very easy to start with, very compelling. So this model was pioneered in 2014 by AWS Lambda. They are still market leader, but there are many more offerings now these days. Specifically today, I'm going to have a look uh, also at Azure Functions and Google Cloud Functions. Those are more uh, used, I guess. At least I use them. Uh, I should notice that uh, Google Cloud are still in beta. So it might change over time. And I'm most familiar with Azure Functions, but I tried not to be biased. Uh, so why, why should, uh, should you use serverless in the first place? What are the benefits? There are three, uh, mostly. So first is abstraction of servers, which comes from the name serverless. Of course, there are servers somewhere, but they are managed by the cloud provider, so you basically don't care. There are several layers of abstraction between developer and actual hardware. The second benefit is auto-scale. So if you need to run, if your event happens once a day, and your function just needs to run once, that's fine. If event happens several hundred times per second, that's also fine. It's the same code without re-architecting should be just run by cloud provider, which is very compelling. And the third one, important one, financial. The billing, everything is based on usage. So if, if the function is used a lot, you pay a little bit more. If it's not used at all, you probably stay inside free tier and you don't pay anything. There's nothing that you provision, there's nothing that you prepay. You just pay some fraction of cents per call. I think you can do about one million calls for one euro, something like that. In this talk, I'm going to focus on, on this middle thing, uh, order scaled, because, yeah, we are talking performance. Uh, so what's the ideal situation? What, what, what cloud providers are selling to us? Well, they say if you, ha you have serverless application and you have only one user, it works. If you have 100, it works. You go up to a million, it still works. So that's about throughput, how many requests you can handle in your application. And while your application is growing, you should also ideally get the same latency from this application. So the, the response time should now like bump up to, to, to uh, minutes or something. It should stay constant in ideal case. So that's what we are going to check today. <coughs> and performance stuff is, can be difficult to communicate in a format like this. Uh, there are lots of charts and numbers and stuff, but I decided to come up with a story which goes through several scenarios, several tales, each one of them illustrating one issue or success of, of serverless technology. Uh, yes, uh, as a basis, I took this quote. Uh, from James Garner. We are living in the age of startups, uh, billion dollar startups. And it says that uh, we are at the point when technology is so easy that a single person, single developer could probably come up with a great idea and then do a startup which was, would be like unicorn billion dollar startup and just do it himself. And in this case, he's probably gonna use serverless technologies just because it's so easy. So that's our scenario. Let's say, do we have any startup owners in the room? Or founders? Yes. OK. Is it 1 billion yet? No. OK. So uh, let's imagine you are the start startup founder. I, I came up with an idea for your startup, so you don't have to work too hard. I think uh, like 
if you go to the housing market, a lot of people are selling and buying houses, lots of money on this market, but there is no like Uber for selling your house yet. So let's, let's imagine to make one. So you, you take your laptop, you start coding, and uh, of course you need to start with a minimum viable product. It, you make a simple web page with just, just input text box where you can put your address and then say, ask her how much is my house worth. There are actually websites like that, but uh, you'll have to compete. Uh, and then you apply some star smart stuff, machine learning, whatever model, and you, you say your house is worth this number. And if it's very accurate, people are going to use it, you will attract some people, and then you'll, you'll start charging for something. You don't know yet, uh, that's a normal startup. Uh, your, your first product is very simple. You have a browser page, which makes a request to serverless application. And you found some friend who is working on a, like a database of previous house purchases or something like that. So there is a service which you can trigger, get the last X payment in the region, and then apply your smart machine learning on top of that and give just one value to the user. That's great. So you start, the first story starts, you just launched, you just told about this startup to your friends and neighbors, so you, you don't have that many users yet. Your user charts lo looks a little bit like this. You have several users per hour, maybe, like on this chart. Is every bar is one user coming to you within five hours, so maybe 20 people, okay. And then it's perfect time to test your performance, right, to, to make sure that everything is right, experience is good. First, you are concerned about the service that they are using. Maybe it is slow, so you measure what is the typical response type of time of that service. So, uh, why access is a response type in milliseconds, and you got some re sample re response times on the chart. And it, this looks great, but you are lucky with, uh, with your provider because it's very dense, so it's very stable. You get response time in around 100 milliseconds, so that, that, that's cool. And then you calculate, okay, I need to do some extra math stuff on top of that. There is some latency there, but I want to be something like 200 millisecond response time. I'll be happy, people will not notice. Immediate response, I'll get more users. That's, that's, that's cool. And by the way, you are so concerned about performance that you want, you, know, you don't know which cloud provider to use yet, so you just use all three of them, the ones which I booked, picked. So you plan to compare and pick one later on. So you start measuring, do, we, do you get 200 milliseconds on any of those providers? You start with AWS, and the chart is, looks like this. The yellow points are end-to-end -end response times that you measure, the black points are still dependency latency. So dependency is fast, that's fine. And some points do, do hit your 200 milliseconds, but not all of them. A lot of them go a bit up. It's still not too bad, 500 or something, but there's something going on here. You check, maybe it's Amazon, so you check Google. Google looks the same pattern, it's just got even slower, you get 100, 1,000 milliseconds now, so second. And you still clearly see two ranges here, so uh, there must be something going on. Azure functions, a bit more blurred, but the same pattern. Slow request, fast request, still there. By the way, is this readable for everyone? You can see the dots? Ah, that's fine. So the thing which is going on here is called cold start. When you first deploy your application to the cloud, the first event comes in, what cloud has to do is to has to provision an instance for you. They have a large pool of workers, generic workers for your language. They pick one of those, they download your code on this worker, apply some configuration, load this into memory, and then it's done. And then it can, it can run your code. If second request comes in, relatively soon after that, they are smart enough to reuse this thing. They, are, they don't want to do this every time. So the next request is gonna be much faster than the first request. And you should understand this when you're, you're measuring. 
But also, if, you're, if your application st stands idle for half an hour, you are not paying for this. So they will just recycle your instance to the, to back to the pool. And the next request will hit the call start again. So on our charts of requests, <coughs> you see that this period of silence it probably causes call start. Even worse than that, if, if two requests come simultaneously, for example, a one button click triggers two calls to your application, then they would probably have to provision two instances at the same time because one instance will only be busy with one request. So both of them will, will hit the start time. So here is our first lesson. Serverless is not magic. You have to understand a little bit how it works to be able to really get the results that you need. And cold starts might be slow. Depending on the language, our example was very simple. I did it in JavaScript and not a lot of code. But if you do it like in Java with uh, huge package dependencies, they would have to load all this at the start. So it can easily go to several seconds or 10 seconds or something like that. So if you are really concerned about the latency, be, be, be sure to optimize the package size and maybe use dynamic language instead. Uh, the second part, your startup is going well. You get users, they are happy. You get a lot of throughput. And here is the chart of, of your us usage. So this is now request per second. So you've grown like three orders of magnitude user-wise. Between 10 and 30 requests per second. So are you still performant? That's your chart. Most of the time, it's okay-ish, but you start to yeah, go up. Sometimes it takes three seconds, sometimes two seconds. You are not happy with this. So what's going on here? Well, first thing to check is, of course, third-party dependency. Is it still good? The black dots are here, and they are not good anymore. You see that all the time you spend, you spend on waiting for that third-party service to complete. You call to your friend, uh, ah, why, why are you so slow? And he says, ah, it's good that you called because I just wanted to switch you off because you're doing so many requests to our database, it's overloaded. Please stop doing this. Okay, so you come up with a new plan. You will use this cloud database, scalable infinitely, instead of that crappy third-party service. But you still need the data, so you will create a new third part of serverless, serverless uh, application, it's called Glue here, because it glues third-party service with your service. And you, you can also throttle that one so that it doesn't do too many requests to your uh, dependencies. Uh, you will load the data, and then you can do multiple requests to the data, scale out, everything's gonna be perfect. So the lesson here is uh, that uh, your application is as fast as your slowest dependency. If most probably not all the dependencies are gonna be serverless or the scaled or the magically. So be sure that when you plan capacity that you don't rely on something which is definitely slower than you. And if you still need to do this, of course you need some third parties or SQL database or something. Make sure that you actually limit the concurrency of your serverless on purpose so that you don't overload that, that one. It's very easy to do the denial of service attack on, 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 some, on your infrastructure. Part three, now we actually want to implement that pipeline, that great plan which, which we just came up with. First, we need to load all the data from that service which is already there, one big import. And then, of course, periodically want to pull new data from there into your database and keep your cloud database updated. So we need one time massive load of data and then periodical or ideally real time, but that's not critical in our case, sync. That's the picture. We make a dump. We put it actually in another, yet another cloud service which is infinitely scalable in theory. Something like uh, Amazon uh, Kinesis or Azure Event Hubs or Google pops up, they all have 
event-based services for you. And then your service glue is listening to that stream of events, processing them, converting to different formats, whatever you need, aggregating, and putting in the appropriate format into your service, serverless database. So to simulate this a little bit, especially this initial dump, I ran uh, a, uh, one million events, one million data points through these services, and came up with this chart. So these are all three providers processing one million events through a service application. I measured it in single threaded on my laptop. It took me seven hours to, to process them locally. Uh, you see that depending on the provider, I got like from 12 minutes to 22 minutes, which is which is good ratio. But the fun part about these charts is that they are all, the, the, the reason of their limit is all different. Google was processing events one by one because of limitation of PubSub. So I've actually hit the limit of account of amount of functions which can run. So actually the limit of serverless. I guess I can call Google and ask for, for higher limit, but that's the default limit which I hit. I cannot go faster than that. For Azure, the, the blue line, you see that it has a very different shape. So even though I, I started with a million, they knew immediately that I'm going to process a million of points. They were not very fast to scale up. They, they were going like this. But the very last minute, they processed like 250,000 events just in one minute. So it, it, it can go fast. And Amazon was just like flat line going through, crunching through events. And the limit there was actually the event, the Kinesis event stream. I provisioned a fixed amount of shards there, and it was just hitting Kinesis limit. There are lots of configurations that you can play with to, to make it faster. For example, for Amazon, you can say that you want to run your serverless instances on different instances of different memory amount. My workload is not critical to memory, but in fact, when you provision more memory, they also provision more CPU to you. So more memory, more CPU time. This is a bit confusing, but they explain it on the documents. So you see that pretty much increasing memory size and CPU two, two times also reduces your processing time two times. So that's, that's a good trade-off. The fastest instance was able to crunch through one million events in just four minutes. So depending on whether you want to go faster and pay more or go slower and pay less, you can pick the instance size. The lessons here, first, uh, serverless is not just for HTTP. Most of the examples start with HTTP, and some of them just end there. But in my opinion, it's much more useful for a synchronous workflow where you need to process data, events. This matches very well the nature of serverless applications, which are event-based. So a message in the queue is an event that that's fits very well, they can predict very well the workload from the queue, te uh, telemetry. They can see the backlog optimized for that. And the second, again, you need to learn the model of your provider, that memory thing, thing for example, for Amazon, the model that uh, events work, the limits imposed by Google or by other providers. You have to learn that if you really want to stretch. Now, the fun one, you migrate it to your favorite cloud database just in time, and then your site really gets popular. For example, the worst thing which can happen to the site, or the best thing for your website performance, I mean, is that you are mentioned on TV show, which is not technical at all, and then lots of people start checking your site all at the same time while TV is online. So the, there is a thing called hacker news and stuff like that, but uh, that's, TV is much worse because it's all in like five minutes and then everybody forgets. 
So I simulated this with a, with a chart like this. I, I, I couldn't find a real TV show to mention by sight. Uh, so very, very beginning of this chart is uh, our usual traffic, several, uh, 10, maybe 20 requests per second. And then within a couple of minutes, it just jumps up to 800. I checked, I think Stack Overflow gets about one and a half thousand per second. So it's, it's still not Facebook, Google, or something like that. But it's half of Stack Overflow, so uh, decent load. So does it work? Let's start with Azure Functions. This is the response time charts. Are you familiar with something called percentiles? If not, that, that means that 90th percentile is basically means that if you take the fastest 90% of your responses, then this is the slowest of them. So that's a border between top 90 and uh, bottom 10. And you see that you, you see the chart like if you if you wouldn't have the background gray thing, you see where the spike was. It, it, it kind of gets slower, but it's still in 300 milliseconds, which is still very fast. If you look at 99th, you okay. Some people notice that it's a bit slow. You got to test 10, two seconds maybe. But okay, that was TV and t yeah, one percent maybe you can lose. Amazon actually did an amazing job. You, you cannot see anything there. Like it's, it didn't notice the, the spike at all. There are some spikes, but th this is just a random thing going on. It's all, including 99th percentile, it's all almost flat. So this is, this is really, really difficult to do with something like self-managed virtual machines or stuff like that, even, even in the cloud, because if you try to scale them up, you will not be able to do this in two, three minutes. You need some metrics to collect. Uh, yes, your CPU is going high, so I need to pr pr produce more of them, and that will take another minute and so on, and you need to do cycles. That's not gonna fly. But this is pretty much handling it without any problems. How did Google do? Well, first it did this. So it pretty much refused to, to process any spike like I was expecting. Why did it happen? Well, that might be my fault because I, I was doing HTTP request from, from the function and every time for every request I was creating a new TCP connection. Well, I was using a library for this, but I was doing like new, new, new every time. So I got out of HTTP request pool and they said, ah, oh, you cannot do that then. There is a documentation which says you shouldn't do this. There is a guideline how to avoid this, but that's very easy to come into this trap. And I did. But then I fixed it and then all the requests were successful and the chart all, also looks awesome. I'm not sure what, what's happening there in the end and in the beginning. They are doing their stuff. But again, you barely ca can see where your spike was based on response time, which is also good. So again, lessons learned. This is the perfect scenario for serverless. If you have spiky load or you have no idea how many users you're going to get, when, or you, shouldn't, you don't want to care this, try. But still know the limits. There are some patterns to, to, to use. There are some pitfalls to avoid. You need to know how that thing works. There are limits which are quite difficult to understand before you meet them, like amount of TCP, new TCP connection made. Uh, so the fifth uh, tale is going to be a bit meta tale about myself. I needed to produce this presentation, this charts, and uh, then how do I do this? How do I load test serverless applications because they are so scaled? Okay. Of course I do it with serverless, so I produced a schema like this because I didn't want to measure like latency across the ocean. And for example, Google can only run in US at the moment. I've provisioned my own serverless worker, which would be calling other serverless application on the test. 
get in metrics from, from that one and then save it in the in metrics database. The schedule on the left is sending the pace, like now is, you should send 1,000 requests, now 10, now 1,000, now 10, and so on. Then it goes to event stream. Event stream triggers serverless function. Each function calls, call makes several calls to our system on the test and the records is out to the database. Very simple, like two hours to come up with the whole code needed for this. But there are even tools which do this for you. For example, a tool called serverless artillery. You just install a package, it, you get a command line, then you say which URL you want to test, how many requests to send, press start, and what this thing will do, it will deploy your AWS Lambda into your account and we'll start DDoS in whatever URL you want to, to DDoS or sorry, load test. You will pay for, for this so you probably it's not economically uh, viable to really DDoS someone but uh, it's fine just for test scenarios like this. So the, lesson, the lessons are simple. Be creative in your user scenario when you need to come up with something which requires Unexpected spikes of, of load, use serverless. And uh, I use it a lot for load testing our own uh, infrastructure, for example, not related to cloud at all. So, coming to conclusions is serverless good for my project, for my startup, or for my enterprise application? Well, the throughput is probably going to be enough especially if you test it in advance and uh, put all the right knobs in place. Your application should not be too critical to latency because it's got always going to be some cold starts and some delays based on some something going on in the infrastructure of cloud provider. And actually, cloud providers, none of those three, give you any SLA on the service. They, they just best effort. Uh, you should not claim, you cannot claim that uh, it was working fast yesterday and now it's working slow. Something happened. Actually, the performance does change over time. I did this test uh, like half a year ago and the results were quite different. So cloud providers are improving. They were quite worse. They are improving. They are really keen to get to the picture like the one from AWS. And uh, you can be, the, can be sure that in the future it's going to be even better. But most probably the performance is not going to be your biggest concern. Please, before starting your big project on serverless, check the tooling, check the architecture, check the pricing, if everything works for you, then go. What are the good scenarios to get started? Well, any prototype related to HTTP or message queuing is a good go. It's very easy. As my first slide showed, you, you start with a couple things. You can be productive. In two hours, you have something running, some prototypes you can show. If your ARP is very low traffic, you get quite generous free tier from all providers. So you can run like every second a job, and you will not pay anything uh, uh, in your monthly bill. I think the, 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 the coolest usage of uh, serverless is to glue in different services together through events and messages, so use it for that. And if you really need some unusual load profiles, like you're expecting it to be on a TV show soon, then also have a look. And I think the lunch is coming, so uh, I'm done a little bit earlier, and uh, you can also ask questions. Thank you. No questions? Oh, yes. Yeah, maybe we should talk after the call. Okay. Yeah.
It's a bit difficult to answer in one sentence. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you.